presenters um, this morning. So we're really excited to talk about dreaming and planning for gardening. So I can't wait for all the snow to disappear so I can start planting things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Julia, you want to go ahead and let folks into the into the room, please. Yep. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. We are going to let folks trickle into, into the room, um, but we are right on time. So we are going to go ahead and get started. It, my name is Shayla Gutierrez. Today I'm joined by Julia, our youth volunteer who will be monitoring the chat room for any questions. A few housekeeping items before we do get started. Your mics are muted to ensure the quality of the sound for today's session. Throughout the session, we do encourage you to ask any questions to be answered at the end of the presentation. Today, I actually have the honor to stream from Eco House, situated on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Ottawandrant nations. At Eco House, we often have programs that invite youth and children to explore the grounds and play on the grounds. So it's always lovely to hear the birds and the bees buzzing and the laughter of children. On our last presentation, we heard from Dar and Kirsten, who suggested that pea shoots are actually a great way to encourage children to eat healthy, which is a great transition to our next presentation titled Growing Up Green and Gardening with Kids. Leading the talk today are guest speakers, Heather Govender, Jessica Hatchie, and Allison Eady. Heather graduated from the University of Toronto with a PhD in plant molecular biology and collaborative program in environmental studies. She is an Ontario certified teacher and a passionate environmentalist and nature lover, both personally and professionally. She loves to forage and garden and shares that love with her two young children. Allison, Allison is a program coordinator with Waterloo Region School Food Gardens and a PhD candidate in community psychology at Wilfrid Laurier University. She loves learning about how things grow and finding ways to connect people with food systems. Jessica Hatchie graduated from McMaster University with a BA in history and diploma in human resource management. After working in recruitment for many years, she left to pursue her, she left to pursue her love of all things outdoors. She is now a freelance photographer and student of herbalism. When she does not have her nose in a book, you can find her backcountry camping, hiking, or experimenting in the garden with her seven-year-old daughter, husband, and pup. She is passionate about protecting the environment and how spending time in nature positively affects our mental health. She is currently using permaculture techniques and native plants to create a sustainable and wildlife friendly food forest at her home in Dundas. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it to our great presenters now. You're muted, Heather. Yep. Um, so I won't be presenting first, but since I'm, I'm the presenter who works at Eco House, I'll give um, just a brief intro to Green Venture. Uh, many of you may be familiar, uh, but we, we have the mission of empowering Hamiltonians to implement greener practices in their homes and communities to make our city a climate champion. And one of the ways that we do that is through workshops like what we're offering today. And my internet's a little slow. I've switched the slide, just waiting for it to change so that I can ask a question of all of you with the prompt on screen, um, but you may as well get ready in the chat. Oh, there we go. Um, so we would love to hear, before we start sharing our stories, we would love to hear who's in the room today. So are you a parent, a grandparent, an educator? Are you an avid gardener, a beginner gardener, wondering what a garden is? Uh, just what, why, what brought you to this presentation? Um, just so we, we know who is here. I'll give a moment for people to put that in the chat. I'm presenting as a, I guess, both a, a parent and an educator. Oh, a grandparent, great. A parent and an intermediate gardener. And then I need to make this bigger so I can see it. 
a three-year-old, grandparent to a three-year-old, an avid gardener, love gardening, grandmother of a six-year-old, so a lot of grandparents in here, and a parent intermediate gardener want, who wants to teach their son to enjoy the ability to grow our own food and enjoy the outdoors, a volunteer at a community garden and a parent, grandmother and a master gardener, oh great. Um, and I, when my little one heard that I was running a gardening workshop, he asked if he could help. So he got into an appropriate outfit and came to join and help me today. All right. So if anyone is still um, thinking and wants to add to the chat, go right ahead and I'll, I'll pass it off to Jessica, who's going to be our first speaker. Awesome. Thanks, Heather. Um, so I am a bit of a beginner gardener myself. Um, so just wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Um, as was said earlier, I used to work in corporate world and all that wonderful stuff for years. And then when my daughter came along, I decided to leave all that behind and kind of pursue all the passionate things that I have in my life, the outdoors and spending as much time as possible with her in the outdoors. Um, and at the beginning that really just started as hiking and camping and those kind of things, because that's what I love to do the most. But um, the past few years, particularly with that lovely pandemic we're still dealing with, um, a lot of our time spent outside has been at home. And that has really expanded our love and passion for looking after our own garden and spending time out in our yard um, and sharing that with each other. So I, I really have gone from the person who said, I don't really want to garden. I just want to, I don't want to weed. I don't want to do any of that stuff. Just give me like plant a tree and leave it. And that's low maintenance for me. Great. Um, and now we have gone on to basically not leaving any corner of our garden alone. We are in every little area, changing things around, doing things in them, experimenting and playing. And we've really been doing it all together and um, kind of hodgepodge and a little bit mixed up in self-learning and making all sorts of fun mistakes and things like that. So I just wanted to, to say, you know, you don't have to be um, a really great gardener. You don't have to have a green thumb. You don't have to have the perfect yard. You don't have to have the perfect anything. You know, a garden is not a place to go. It's a journey as my, one of my heroes, Monty Don, if you know who he is, he's a gardener in the UK um, and I adore him. And that is one of the things that I really think about when I go out into our yard. It's not a place for us. It's a journey and a place for us to explore and learn things and have fun together. So um, yeah, you'll see that for me is I went from won't touch a weed to I am obsessed with all things gardening and it's been a wonderful journey for all of us. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and when I first started thinking about what did I want to talk about, I was really there's so many things to talk about with gardening. I mean, you can literally make uh, an entire day or your entire, <clears throat> excuse me, entire life all about gardening. But since we are talking about kids with gardening, I thought I would talk to my daughter first and find out what it is um, about gardening that she loves the most. So that might be some inspiration as well. So these are her words. Um, she told me that she loves all the seeds and their different shapes and textures and feeling things. So um, that's one of the things we do together is when I'm going to pick out seeds or starting to plant them, she does that with me. She gets to touch and feel and learn what each one is and what it does. Um, she'll plant them as well, and uh, she really loves how there's really funky shaped ones. I don't know if you've ever seen a calendula seed, but it's got a really cool horned um, hooked C shape. Anyway, she just thinks that's really cool. Of course, little baby seedlings are adorable and so cute, so she loves that. Um, she really likes the idea of having babies and growing them herself uh, and having them start really tidy and so cute and then having them explode like our tomato plants did last year, which was really awesome. They were taller than she was. So she got a real kick out of, you know, seeing it start from little tiny thing to growing to this giant um, plant and eating from it. Uh, something that of course made me really happy and a little bit teary was saying that she liked to garden because she gets to be with mom. Um, and of course, that's one of my favorite things as well is just um, spending that time with her, but knowing that she values that as well was um, really nice to hear. So hopefully that's something um, that continues, you know, I'm sure as she gets a little bit older, maybe that'll wane away a little bit, but 
Um, right now, we're really enjoying spending that time together. So that's been great. Um, she also told me that she loves how the garden looks so beautiful in the summer with all the different colors. Uh, she likes to go out and see all the different flowers, sometimes pick some of the different flowers and make some artwork and things out of it. So having lots of variety in different colors uh, really makes her happy. Worms, of course, because seven uh, worms are pretty awesome. And she knows that worms are really important because, you know, they eat a lot of the things that are in the soil and help um, add nutrients to the soil, which makes our plants grow much bigger and stronger. One of our favorite things um, about growing our own food is called morning harvest in our house. So we have a little um, harvest bag or a basket that she takes out in the mornings during the spring, summer and fall. And we'll basically go and pick whatever is ripe um, and eat it either right off the vine, which is great, or we'll bring it in to have for breakfast, lunch or dinner. Um, so that's a lot of fun. And then also when we're just playing out back, we have, you know, a few berry bushes and things like that. So she likes just being able to stop what she's doing, play, go have a few strawberries or a few raspberries and then get right back to playing without having to stop. You know, that's pretty fun for her. Uh, playing the dirt, of course, always popular with kids. This is a real excuse to play in the dirt and get dirty. And it's not a bad thing, right? This is their chance to like get dirt under their fingernails and on their faces and try out new things and dig and explore the kind of messy side of gardening. So that's a lot of fun. Um, and of course, the animal friends that come to visit our yard because of all of the different things we've planted. So uh, we have so many birds that come to our yard. Um, actually, this past spring, we had a huge flock of blackbirds. I'm not exactly sure what they were, but there were probably 30 of them. And they descended on our yard for an afternoon and just kind of ate and did their thing before flying off again. We have a couple of bunnies that come and, you know, squirrels that come and dig and hide things in our yard. So having our little animal friends come to visit is also a big part of why she loves to garden. So, um, and then after I spoke to her, I was like, okay, well, those are the things that she really loves about gardening, but why do I love gardening with her? Because gardening can be um, something that we do that can be pretty particular, or um, we have certain ways that we like to do things. Um, and that doesn't always pan out the way we plan when we have little helpers. However, there are some really, really awesome things that happen when my little one is in the garden with me. Um, and the first thing is watching her get so, so excited when something new pops up. So for example, we've just started um, a couple of seeds uh, already. So we've started peppers and onions and we have the tiniest, tiniest little sprout coming up from one already. And that's just the greatest thing ever. Um, going out and seeing um, blooms that maybe bloom at different times of the year, spring, summer and fall. She gets really excited when there's something new or something new to eat that we've, um, that we've planted that she's really excited to eat. Um, the other thing that's really great is if you let them kind of choose their own fruits and vegetables that they might want to try, they might eat things that may not have normally had before. So um, at the beginning, it was mentioned, you know, peas were a really great thing to grow um, because it's really great for kids, but there's all sorts of things. Last year, she picked beets. She wanted to try planting beets because they looked beautiful on the package. So I was like, great, let's, let's have some beets. So we planted beets and she tried beets for the first time this year, which is great, uh, or sorry, last year. And this year um, she wants to try cucamelons. I've never had those before either, but we're gonna plant them and give them a try and maybe we'll love them and we'll have a new great food to eat. Um, you can actually see in the picture there, that was a morning harvest that we did. So there's carrots and peas and chives and uh, cherry tomatoes. She picked those all that morning, chopped them up herself and ate them for breakfast. So. I'm certainly not gonna argue with her having a giant bowl of vegetables for breakfast. Does she have it every day? Of course not, but it gives her the opportunity to do that where we wouldn't have had it normally. Um, and then just watching her learn things about the garden on her own and find things that she's really interested in, and she'll teach me things. Um, for example, we had, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but she loves carnivorous plants. They're not outside in our garden, they're inside um, in our home. But man, oh man, carnivorous plants were just the coolest thing ever. And so we got books from the library and let her experiment with some of them here. And we had a really great time with it. So now I know some of the Latin names of 
carnivorous plants. And I never would have known that had she not expressed that side of interest in gardening as well. So those are some of my favorite things. Um, and also I'll just say as in a bit of an aside, um, you know, during the pandemic, it really gave us a really great excuse to be outside and doing things together that weren't Pokemon. <laughs> so that's really nice too. Um, seeing her love being outside and knowing that she's going to look after the planet because of that love is really rewarding for me. Um, she'll go outside and see that there might be some litter in the garden or something like that. She'll be the first one to go and pick it up. Um, when we're on walks and hikes and things like that, she'll get upset if she sees you know, litter or things on the ground. So we always bring a bag with us and it's because she loves our garden and all of the plants that we see around us. And she wants to look after them. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, and it just, it makes me hopeful that uh, as we keep teaching the kids these things, they'll keep looking after the planet, um, which of course is super, super important. Um, watching her confidence too, uh, in using tools and doing things around the garden. Um, you can see there, she was helping me turn some soil in the front garden. Um, she helps me plant different vegetables. She knows how to start seeds. She can use all of the tools, uh, shears, all sorts of stuff like that. You know, obviously you're going to want to watch them at first and make sure they're not going to hurt themselves and teach them how to use it properly. But um, watching her be able to do those things on her own and feel confident and strong in doing that is a wonderful thing. Um, and then also watching her apply that knowledge while we are camping. This is Elizabeth, she's peeking over. So I'm just gonna, this is my Elizabeth, she's seven. Hi. <laughs> sprouts. Sprouts, yes, Brussels sprouts. That's another thing, we like those too. Um, but yes, just having her apply that knowledge while we're not at home and not in our garden. We'll be hiking a trail or camping or at somebody else's house and she'll see something that she recognizes and she'll get really excited and she'll share that knowledge with her friends or grownups around the area. So watching her apply that knowledge elsewhere is pretty rewarding as well. Oh yeah, there she is. She is sketching uh, some plants in that photo. <laughs> So um, you can see on the picture there, uh, the bottom left, that's how we started. Um, we started with a really small square patch of um, garden in our backyard. We planted some tomatoes, some really sad cucumbers you see there, they were not doing so well. Uh, some chives and things like that. That's how we started out. We made tons of mistakes. I learned a lot, she learned a lot um, and we just loved it. So we kept going. Um, and now we've expanded that knowledge and are continuing to grow. So we have now four um, raised vegetable beds that we use. We've got a rain garden out in the front um, that Green Venture helped us out with to help with some of our wastewater and it's redirecting that. Um, we've got wildlife gardens and native plants, all helping to feed all the flora and fauna in the area, and of course, providing us with beautiful uh, flowers and things like that as well. Um, and then we've also begun a food forest in our backyard. So I have kind of delved into permaculture and uh, food forests. So basically planting um, fruit trees and berry bushes and different leafy greens and all sorts of things like that in our regular garden so that we can go and forage from our own backyard. Um, and with that increase, we've really been able to do a lot of other things with it, sharing our produce with family and friends and also the community um, through Green Venture again and the community fridges. And then what, just being able to uh, watch my little one help out with all of the other community events and things like that makes her feel really good too. Uh, and yeah, like I was saying before, you just want to follow their lead a little bit and let them tell you what they're interested in in the garden. So as I was saying, Elizabeth loves, loves, loves carnivorous plants. Uh, you can see we had quite a variety there for a little bit. We had pitcher plants um, and we had Venus flytraps, uh, a bladder wart, I think is in there, a trumpet pitcher. Um, so yes, she really loved the idea that these plants ate ate meat, so they were carnivorous. It wasn't just water and sunlight. They needed plants to grow and they were hunters and they had their own special ways of trapping things. Um, so 
we got this book from the library and we studied things. Um, she learned lots of different things. And now we have a whole bunch of carnivorous plants in our house. And I will tell you that it's an extra added benefit because it helped with fruit flies in our house last summer. So last summer I had a, a big old bushel of uh, tomatoes and we weren't getting through them quick enough. And one of them started to turn and of course fruit flies floor everywhere. Could not get rid of them, could not get rid of them. We brought Elizabeth's pitcher plants down and put them on our kitchen windowsill and in three days gone, everything completely wow. gone. So I will never be without a carnivorous plant in my kitchen now, especially in the summer because it's been a really big help for us um, just to get rid of fruit flies whenever they come around. So if you're looking for a non, you know, chemical way of dealing with fruit flies, get yourself a carnivorous plant and it can be a big help. We also um, took a look at them while we were hiking and things like that too. So it's been a lot of fun uh, to see them growing in Canada. The other thing we make sure in this house is, you know, with kids, you can't, it's not a very serious business gardening. You know, as much as you may want to have certain things done a certain way, you kind of got to plan a little bit for the unexpected and plan for some things to go a little funky, but have fun with it and explore different ways of interacting with the garden that aren't just weeding and, you know, the chores of everything. So we love to make uh, plant bugs. You can see Elizabeth had made a plant bug there um, with different things from the garden. Um, and then also our breakfasts, we try and incorporate a little bit of things from our garden, those strawberries there. Um, I made into a little bit of a Venus flytrap there um, so that she could use that in conjunction with her books and things like that. We just really kind of take it as it comes. Um, and have fun rather than just making it a job. We also take our gardening with us wherever we go. So as much as yes, the garden is our outside at home kind of thing, we take it with us when we're traveling. Uh, you can see there, we take our little harvest basket with us on the trail. Um, we have a few special trails that we really like to do during summer berry season because the raspberries and blackberries are everywhere. Um, and so we take them along with us uh, and then we just heart, uh, forage on the way. Um, just, you're going to want to be careful with foraging. Obviously you're going to want to make sure that anything that you're picking in the wild is safe to eat. There's a few books that you can, well, there's a million books out now um, that you can reference for foraging um, and foraging with kids as well. And so that's one of the ways that we really like to take gardening with us. Um, and we also explore family and friends gardens. So the other photo you see there is my uh, friend Lucia's parents' place. Um, they have a huge garden. They've been gardening their whole lives. And so it's nice to go and see other people's gardens. She gets a chance to check out different fruits and vegetables, ask questions, things like that, and then help out with, of course, harvesting and eating them and snacking along the way. Um, the biggest thing I can tell people with kids who want to garden, though, really, in my experience, is kind of letting go of expectations, um, letting go of perfection, because it never, doesn't really exist. Uh, something we say in this house a lot is practice makes progress rather than practice makes perfect, because there's no such thing as perfect. But every little thing that you do can be progress. Um, even if it's just, you know, trying a new plant or going out and playing in the dirt for a couple of minutes, whatever it is, that's all the little things, they do add up and it progresses not only your garden and your relationship, but also their love of the outdoors as well. Um, so that would be my biggest tip. And again, my, my friend Monty Don, I love his quote. It's inevitably the real garden with a growing family of children will be untidy, messy, even noisy, often destructive. And it can, can drive control freaks like myself. I am a recovering perfectionist too, so I can relate, but I do hate it when they're not there. So having Elizabeth in the garden really just makes it more of a special place um, because not only is it a place that looks beautiful and I feel good, but now we have memories in this garden as well. You know, when I look at the things we've planted, I remember planting that with her. And she remembers how we did it and she remembers how it tasted and she's excited to try it next year and things like that. So it's a place that is beautiful, but it's also just a place where we get to be together and spend that time and have those memories. And I hope that she's gonna take that with her 
as well as she grows. Um, and maybe if she decides to have kids one day, she'll garden with them too. And that would be really great. Thanks. All right. Uh, so I'm Heather and I'm a mom of two kids, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And we love being outdoors together in the garden or, or otherwise just among nature. We love trees. And as Shayla said at the beginning, uh, I, I am a plant biologist. I have a PhD in plant biology, but I don't really have that green of a thumb. I had a lot of difficult conversations with my PhD supervisor to let him know that I had killed my plants again and had to start the experiment over again. So I'm really not that great of a gardener, um, but and I'll share my experience from that place of not really being that good about good at it, but loving it and trying to share that with my kids. So one of my favorite ways to introduce them to gardening is to do what I call zero effort gardening and to be really loose with the definition of what constitutes a garden. Um, so these are dandelions. Those are my kids harvesting dandelions and having a great time with it. And I didn't plant those dandelions, but they do grow in my garden. These ones are in my yard, but they definitely grow in my garden. So we, we consider this part of our gardening experience and look how much they love it. This is one of our favorite things. And then we, we spend time together outdoors. And then in the kitchen, uh, we make dandelion syrup, which is so much fun and delicious. We make dandelion fritters. And throughout the season, my kids will be playing outside and then they'll come in with a bouquet of dandelions and say, mommy, let's make fritters. And they, they love it and I love it. And then other free foods as well. So this is more zero effort gardening and stuff that it takes very, well, no investment of time or money or resources. Um, so the dandelions, you can go outside and pick for free. Uh, just make sure you're picking them from somewhere you know hasn't been sprayed with pesticides or anything else you might not want on your food. Um, so they're, they're picking some, I think those are choke cherries from a tree. Uh, harvesting grape le grapevine leaves in the middle and then on the right they're looking for fiddleheads much too late but I, I didn't tell them that they we just went they wanted to look for fiddleheads so we went exploring and tried to find some and we we also we're fortunate to have a lawn that doesn't have all that much grass in it it's a mix of a lot of different species um, I love the biodiversity of our lawn and it has a whole bunch of wild strawberries so we can get down on our knees and, and pick the strawberries at the right time of year and it's they're fun and delicious and um, my, my kids love it so those are some of our, our free foods that don't take any actual gardening skills uh, and does any time I talk about foraging or picking wild foods, I, I like to include some words of caution because it there are some that are very safe um, and easy to recognize. Um, but I wanted to show some spruce tips on the left compared to you on the right, because spruce tips are safe and nutritious, full of vitamin C, and you is deadly poisonous. Um, so just make sure that you, you really know what you're looking for before you try doing something like this. And even dandelions have a, a common lookalike. So just make sure you know what you're looking at. Yeah, and then just a second. Um, I, I also make sure that we enjoy the whole process because uh, sometimes you won't get a bountiful harvest. Things won't work the way you expect. Um, so we just make sure to enjoy the entire thing. I tried to put a picture of some of my failed plants here, but for some reason I don't have very many. I didn't take any pictures of all the, the plants that didn't work out. Uh, so instead I put a picture of a failed batch of dandelion syrup where we were busy doing too many things at once and it boiled the dry instead of boiling into a lovely dandelion tea that could be turned into a syrup. Um, uh, so these are some photos of the process last year of putting in our pumpkin patch, which was, it was the first time I've ever grown pumpkins and my, my kids were so excited about it. We had big plans to harvest our uh, Halloween pumpkins from our own backyard and it, it didn't work very well. This is one of those patches that ended up with, uh, I weighed a bunch of dead pumpkin plants at the end of the year. And before kids, I, I would have looked at that and thought, oh my goodness, what a waste of time that was and being very disappointed. But going through the process with kids, we enjoyed every step along the way. We liked planning it. We, we loved scooping the dirt. Okay, tell, all right. Can wait, that's actually, can you tell them that in a minute? Tombo's anticipating where this is going and I, I'll let him share the, the happy um, part of the story. Not that any is not happy because I love the whole thing, um, but we had so much fun scooping the dirt. We loved planting the seeds and then watching the first little seedlings sprout. We loved all the critters that came to visit it. 
And even though we ended up with a bunch of dead plants, it's just the, the entire process was filled with learning and making memories. And I, I I'm, I'll, will have those memories forever and hopefully that learning forever. And then it was a nice surprise when, what did we find? When we found some pumpkin that I, when I found pumpkins that just, and one of the, the fixed itself by, by like magic and the other one was a, was tiny because it just started because it all uh, just ripened yeah so we we thought it was just a, a whole patch of dead pumpkin plants but one time when we walked closer tombo spotted two successful pie pumpkins two pie pumpkins that actually did grow and they were just hiding under the dead plants so we got to harvest no, mommy, two pumpkins swear, that one wasn't hiding it was the oh, green okay one was, wasn't hiding yeah one was the screen camouflaged with the others all right. So we, we did, we got to make the most delicious pumpkin pie and it was so much fun to do it with something that we grew in our own backyard. Um, but this, this process would have been a lot of fun and definitely worthwhile, even if we didn't end up finding these two surprise pumpkins after we thought none had worked. So I'm going to share some of my, my favorite um, lessons learned and some of what has really worked for me in gardening with kids. Uh, one is gardening with kids. It doesn't have to mean a lot of prep planning or equipment. So some years I have the best intentions, but I'm a busy person. I always have a lot on the go. And sometimes I get to April and realize I haven't started my tomato seedlings yet. And if, if you're an avid gardener, you know that that's too late to start your tomato seedlings. So sometimes we'll end up going out and buying some seedlings, but we also just do things like going out and harvesting spruce tips from our spruce trees because they grow happily on their own in our garden, or we'll go harvest the, the, the dandelions and the wild strawberries, all those things that don't need me to be on top of things uh, in order to be able to get a good harvest. And gardening doesn't always require a garden. So it could be a walk through the woods or looking for some of those, those safe wild foods that um, I, I, I do want to mention sustainability as well, because there are a lot of things, especially during COVID, I think um, foraging became a lot more popular and there are some things that are becoming over harvested. So if you do want to get into this, make sure you do some research and learn about uh, where you're allowed to forage and how to do it sustainably. But um, that is another way to get into gardening without actually needing to be able to garden or have space for a garden. Uh, and we've also really loved growing foods from food scraps and that you can do just on a windowsill. It's, it's really easy to have success. You don't have to remember to water them every day because there's already a substantial plant there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's great for experimentation and the, the kids love it. And it's so much fun when you see like green onions regrowing from the, the little bottom of them or carrot greens growing from, um, from a carrot, uh, the, the top of a, the cut top of a carrot. Um, and definitely enjoy the process. It can be about every step along the way. It doesn't have to be just about the harvest at the end. Um, and that also means sometimes letting them fail. Uh, so if, uh, like if, if my, um, if one of my kids says, oh no, I really think this should go in this way. And they're trying to plant something roots up, for example, uh, which actually happened when we were growing from scraps and, um, and Tombo just thought the carrot looked like the, the greens should go down into the water. Um, and rather than trying to correct that and say, no, you're wrong, just let, let them do it. Let them plant it how they like, and just watch what happens. And they'll, they'll get so much more from the process that way. Uh, and it's, it's, it's good practice to be able to fail in a way that's still fun and safe and um, maybe remove some of that pressure of always getting things right. And, um, and then that brings me to redefining success because it, it doesn't need to mean having a big, beautiful garden. Uh, I've had to redefine success for years because as I said, I'm not a very good gardener, um, but I love it. Um, so it's, it's worth it for me to keep at it and keep trying. And I'm, I'm going to keep trying. We have big plans for our garden this year. Um, Jess Tombo was actually making plans for our garden while you spoke when you mentioned berries he was telling me no mommy we need to grow berries this year um, yeah it's gonna be gonna be great and one of my big lessons that I've learned is to resist the urge to to teach um, and I want to share a story that always sticks with me uh, one time Tombo came to me and said mommy I found some seeds in my orange I want to plant them and I was busy with work, I was distracted. And I said, oh, oranges don't grow here. They need to grow somewhere that's warm all year round. And I immediately regretted that because my child was coming to me excited to 
engage in nature and to plant something and watch it grow. And instead of nurturing that curiosity, I immediately shut it down. And what I wish I had said is great, let's go find some dirt. And thankfully I've had many, many do-overs since then because my kids often bring me things and want to try planting them. Um, and so now we do, we do, we just go try it. Some of them are things that end up working and some don't, but it's, it's always uh, a lot of fun. And I think there's so much more learning that happens when you just let the learning happen rather than trying to always teach. Um, there are times when I decide to teach, usually when it's something around safety, uh, like around foraging and teaching rules, like don't touch anything if you don't know what it is. And um, like, well, for now, since they're, they're five and three right now, they're not allowed to forage um, without me. Um, although in our own backyard, they, they are allowed to harvest dandelions. So I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. They can forage dandelions in our backyard because they, they know for sure which ones are the dandelions. Um, now, for me, when I do have some successes when I'm starting my garden, uh, like starting seedlings, and then I'm finally getting them in the ground. It's really stressful for me if my kids are taking those seedlings and if they do try to plant them upside down, for example, or if they're being too rough with them, and I know it's a plant that doesn't like its roots disturbed. Um, and it, it was becoming less fun. And it was a lot of me saying, no, no, like, don't do it like that. Don't, um, don't damage the plant. We worked really hard on that. And it's, it was taken away from it. It wasn't as fun for the kids or for me. So I started giving them their own space, whether it's just a little corner of the garden or their own, their whole own garden. And then I let them just take the lead on that garden. Um, so if there is any space in your garden where it would be really hard to just let them do their thing, I highly recommend trying to find a way to let them have that freedom to just make all the mistakes in their own patch. Um, and don't lose sight of what's most important. And for me, it's, I want my kids to love gardening. I want them to love this planet so that they're more likely to want to protect it. And I, I just want to keep having fun. I don't want it to become a chore. I want them to just love the entire process like I do. And my, some of my favorite things that make it worthwhile to go through all this are exploring nature with my kids and watching them learn. Oh, <laughs> Tom spotted the snake that he was holding. That's him holding a, a baby snake there. And um, on the right is his brother Forrest falling in love with the cat he did. And just letting go of my expectations because uh, things don't always happen the way I expect them to. And that's okay. I, I can go with these big plans and expect them to whoa, 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 have this whole process in mind. And then we might not get any further than watering the garden, noticing it makes mud. And then we spend a couple hours playing in the mud. Um, and I just, I try to just let, let things happen like that because the most important thing is that we all keep loving it. And I'll pass it over to Allison. Thanks, Heather. So I am a program coordinator with Waterloo Region School Food Gardens. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about gardening with slightly older kids. Um, a lot of what we do, we do work with elementary school age kids, but a lot of what we've been focusing on in the past couple of years is bringing in you know, middle to high school age kids and figuring out what brings them to the garden and how we can draw them into gardening, growing food and food systems as a whole. Um, so Waterloo Region School Food Gardens, we are a kind of sub-project of Seeds of Diversity. Um, we're funded by a, currently a three-year Ontario Trillium Foundation grow grant. And kind of the way we started out as an organization was through a partnership of different groups of um, teachers, parents, garden enthusiasts, and public health workers in Waterloo. Um, Waterloo schools actually have a really neat history of gardening in schools. We're in kind of a funny area that's a mix of very urban and very rural. So some of our kids don't have backyards, they don't have places they can grow things, and some of our kids live on farms. And the schools here have made a really neat kind of mix of ways to incorporate gardening into schools and we wanted to show up to support that. So a lot of what we did in our first couple of years was providing grants to schools to build gardens and figuring out how to provide programming for teachers and parents who wanted to do that. And then 2020 hit and we suddenly didn't have access to a lot of our schools. A lot of our schools were saying, you know, even if we do go back, we don't know if we can have a garden because there's so many restrictions on this. And we kind of took this as a chance for a giant experiment. Um, as a bit of a background, I'm not an expert gardener. I'm a psychologist. Um, I am interested in how to engage young people in sustainability and food systems. 
Um, but I am learning as I go, as are the rest of my staff. We come from a bunch of different backgrounds. Um, so we've been looking for a while. You know, there's a lot of energy from especially parents of young kids. There's a lot of community programs and things like that for younger kids, even though they're still nowhere near enough to garden in schools, to do gardening work at home. But there's kind of a gap when kids hit that kind of middle school to high school age. There's not a ton of resources. So what we wanted to figure out, especially when they couldn't garden in their schools, was how do we get these kids space to be involved? What kind of things are they looking for? What gets them excited to be involved in the garden? So we kind of shifted a bit, a bit of our programming to call it youth and food systems instead of school food gardens. That's kind of our sub program because we weren't really in the schools at the time. And we took this as a giant experiment to kind of recruit a few youth that we already knew were interested and let them figure out how to bring their peers, let them figure out what got them excited about gardening and how we could bring more of that for them. So we kind of framed a lot of our programming that year around a couple of things. And we used a hybrid model of both in-person outdoor learning at some of the schools that lent us their gardens when they couldn't be there. And online learning, because that was the space where a lot of youth were looking for things to do. And we built a lot of it around our youth food farmers market. So in previous years, we'd had this market where we were looking for ways to engage, especially high school students from our schools that had gardens, and kind of building up their connection about, you know, when you grow food, where does that go next in the food system? Where does your food come from? Where are the farms in your region? What kind of food grows here? What kind of food gets imported? And so we built a lot of our programming for the past couple of summers around how do we bring in youth to kind of fill in the gaps in summer maintenance at some of our schools, because this is an open garden space that we can use. We had some really, really generous offers from some of our elementary schools that had gardens who couldn't garden that year to just let us take over for the summer and plant something that would grow in the fall. And we could use the produce for our market. We could use the garden as a teaching space. And so we decided to, you know, take some big risks, both on our part and, you know, asking the youth to be pretty brave. And we said, you guys are in charge. We want to have a market. We have these gardens. What do you want to grow? What do you think is going to sell? How do we get it from the market, from the garden to the market? How should we price things? What do you think people want? And so we took this as a chance to really, as, as kind of both Heather and Jessica have said, be brave, be willing to make mistakes. We had some backup from some really awesome local farmers who let us kind of fill a gap in with their produce that they donated. But we got together a bunch of youth and we kind of mixed working online and in person to say, let's do some research. You know, are you, if you want to get involved in a garden, if you want to figure out what the market's like, let's research what the prices are at your local grocery stores. What are you excited about eating? What do you see selling at your local farmer's markets? And then we're going to come back together to talk about if we have from, you know, April or May, because we started a little bit late until August, September, what can we grow in that time? Here's the space we have. Here's the time we have. Here's the people we have. How do we put that into action? And what we found is there's a lot of energy from especially older kids who are ready to take a bit of responsibility, who are really figuring out who they are and what they want to do, to take some leadership, take some ownership, and take some big risks in kind of leading the garden. So, um, sorry, could you go back one slide, Heather? <laughs> Thanks. So here are some of the things that we learned from letting our youth kind of be in charge. Um, first of all, if you give them the space to be in charge, you're not necessarily guaranteeing the success of that plot, but they are so ready to step up and figure out how to grow. Um, we also figured out that some of the older youth because they're kind of getting a bigger picture of the world, because they're starting to explore things on their own and learn about kind of bigger food systems, they're really ready to make connections to a bigger picture. And what they really like, even if they're not so into gardening at the moment, is connecting what they're doing in the garden now to what they can do with that later. They're really interested in learning about cooking, learning about recipes they can try, um, people they want to share information with, places to donate extra food to. And then also learning about things like careers in food systems, because they're really thinking about who they're going to be out in the world by themselves. And one of the biggest things that we learned about engaging older youth, they have a lot of demands on their time. They have a lot of expectations for independence as they're figuring out who they are. And especially as younger kids, there's a lot more structure into how you interact with the garden, with your family, with your school. And as older kids, they're really figuring out how does that work for them as individual people. 
So we really tried to be flexible about ways to get involved. So there were some kids who did not want to get their hands dirty. Great. You can help us out with, you know, doing the planning. You can help us with figuring out pricing. You can help us figuring out the market plan as a whole. You can help us coordinate other people, coordinate the maintenance plan. We also really wanted to practice the idea that there are definitely chores involved in gardening. And, you know, learning those chores, especially as you grow, can be a really great way to build routine and build consistency in your life. But especially when they're first getting involved in the garden, we didn't want it to feel like a chore. So figuring out ways to bring fun moments, ways to build around, you know, not expecting everybody to join in in every single stage, but how we can work together to fill in all the blanks for what needs to happen in the garden. And the other thing is finding those wow moments, because there's a lot of moments in gardening, especially if you're not there every day, that can just feel like a lot of work, um, particularly in the building stages, particularly in the planning. And for each youth, what that wow moment is like is really different. So for some of them, it was seeing the seedlings start to sprout. For some of them, it was seeing the harvest day. For some of them, it was seeing people show up to buy the produce they grew. Uh, for some of them, it was planning recipes. For some of them, it was bringing produce home to their parents. There's lots of different moments and you can't make that moment happen every day. But if you can build different activities around pulling those things in as much as you possibly can, that's another big draw to gardening. The other thing we really found with some of our older youth is there's a big tendency to say kids need to get off their phones, they need to get offline. No, we were tempted sometimes to say like, put your phones away in the garden. Sharing what they're learning is a really, really important thing, especially as kids start to learn how to communicate with their peers, figure out who they are and how they're learning online. Sometimes when they have their phones out in the garden, they're sending a picture of a cool bug to their friends. And another thing that our youth really liked to bring out from the garden, especially on the days where we couldn't be there in person, was doing a little bit of background research, you know, figuring out where they can learn about this, finding gardening mentors. There's actually a really cool growing young gardener TikTok. There are a bunch of social media figures of youth figuring out how they grow. And our youth wanted to be a part of that. So we actually gave them a lot of control over our social media and we've built building up a little program over time to have them write blog posts about different food systems issues that are interesting to them. They did um, feature posts on our social media, like our Instagram, highlighting produce we were growing and how to you know, use it in cooking, how to grow it, tips for maintaining it. Um, and they really liked not only sharing the stuff with their friends, but they loved the idea that they could take this stuff to their families. They might inspire other youth. They loved teaching this stuff to their younger siblings. So not only are they stepping up and learning themselves, but they're also becoming a part of sharing this with other people. And this is a great chance for them to kind of feel that leadership, to feel that, you know, they're getting the hang of something and they can teach it to other people too. And it's also create part of creating this kind of broader green culture where you feel like they're joining a bigger picture of other people their age who like to garden, other people who want to see the world they want to live in too. So there, there is place for social media in the gardens. And the other place we went with it that was especially helpful in you know, the months where we really couldn't get in the garden or where we were you know, working with kids who lived out of district and couldn't show up to the maintenance days and even throughout the gardening season was really making those bigger connections. So again, as older kids are learning, they can make such bigger picture connections as they grow. So once you start learning, you know, as Heather and Jessica have been saying about, you know, planting things at a really young age, seeing what you can grow in your backyard, learning what you can forage, that can be a really, really great starting point for bigger conversations about things like sustainability, about food justice, about community, about food security. And as kids age, you can figure out how deep you can delve into these topics and you can figure out what areas of this are really interesting to them. So we have, again, our blog series where the youth are exploring topics that are interesting to them. We also have an interview series where we're having some of our high school students interview people who work in the food systems, because a lot of these kids are saying, I love gardening at home. I like gardening with you guys. I like teaching people about food. I'm thinking about what I want to be when I grow up. How do I do this every day? And a lot of people, especially who grew up in cities, don't know about, you know, jobs in food systems, don't know about how to actually become a farmer, don't know about, you know, different places in the food chain where you can get involved. So those are great opportunities to dig into. And when kids ask questions about things like, you know, how do I become a farmer? You know, what do I, what do I need to become an urban gardener? Again, we're not experts. The biggest thing we do is go, I don't know, let's look that up together.
So the biggest thing we learned throughout all of this process is like, again, echoing what Heather and Jessica have been saying today, it's okay to not be an expert. If anything, it's an advantage to not be an expert. You know, it's great if you have those like pro gardening tips to bring in, but we found it's a really, really great way to level the playing field and kind of build something together to be able to say, I have no idea. Let's figure this out together. You know, I'm not the expert. I'm not teaching you. We're just like finding our curiosity here and figuring out where that takes us. With a lot of young people, they're the biggest kind of gap we can fill. Again, we live in the age of the internet. There's so much access to information out there. And, you know, that's a big, scary world for a lot of young people to experience, to get out into. And there is a lot of misinformation out there. So some of the biggest tools that we provide are figuring out, you know, what are your reliable sources? You know, who can you trust with this information? Where can you go if you want to learn more about this? And connecting youth with different people and organizations and spaces where they can build themselves up this way. But really the biggest thing that we've learned is just be there when you have questions and kind of help them figure out the answers for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much to all three of you for sharing your knowledge. Um, we do have a few great comments in the chat room and questions. So I'm going to uh, just read really quickly um, a few of the comments that came in. So um, says this mindset is super helpful. Steph says, and um, it's an amazing way of incorporating their current climate and culture to the green culture and gardening. What an amazing opportunity. Um, Sue says, I agree with Seth. This is fantastic. They are learning so much about sustainability and how to communicate that with others to get them excited and involved. And I think you re really hit it on the nail, Allison, when, when you said that a lot of people aren't aware that these, these careers exist. So I think when you get them young, that's really how you keep them, um, how you make them a lifer, really. Um, but you can also do it um, when you become older, you, right? You find, you find a love for it. I, I didn't know gardening was a career or a choice, right? But now I'm thankful that I have found that in my older, older life. So um, one of the questions that came in was directed to Jessica about the carnivorous plants. Where would you find a carnivorous plant? <laughs> Sure. Um, so Venus flytraps are actually pretty common um, at garden centers. You just kind of got to find them. They're usually really small and at like the, the front counters or things like that. I think In we Japan? got ours. Oh, Elizabeth says Japan. So you can go there too. Uh, but if that's not on your list right now, uh, I think I picked up one at Conan's. Um, and another one at Garden Gallery. It's pretty simple for some of them. Um, some of the other ones, um, there's actually a few- um, Like picture plants, plants. Like picture plants, yes. Um, that I managed to find from uh, folks on Instagram of all things. There are a few folks um, in the works. Hamilton area that, uh, that sell plants. Um, and so I will say the one thing to kind of caution about that is you're going to want to be a little bit careful um, not all of these plants are native, obviously, so there's some, some considerations that you want to take into account there, okay, like, you... for example, just a sex sweetheart, uh, what they're planted in um, and where they're coming from. So if that's something that concerns you, I would just say, take a look at that. But other than that, the Venus flytraps, like I said, they're really common and pitcher plants I've seen in just the regular um, garden centers in the area too. So yeah. that's how I did it. Yeah, it's hard to keep them alive. I found I tried with the Venus flytrap once and it just didn't work out. Um, you have to soak <laughs> them. They love so much water that you basically have to like, it's very opposite from basically all of my other plants. I have to water them, if not every day, then every other day. So I find that you really have to stay on top of how moist they are. But other than that, I love having them in our kitchen. <laughs> And it gets um, fruit flies. That's right. Yeah, the fruit fly. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. So the next question would be for Heather. Would you be able to pass along the dandelion fritters recipe? It's always a always a hit, isn't it, Heather? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I, I don't even actually follow a recipe. So I can just tell you now if, um, if I'm feeling a little rushed, I just mix flour and water until they have kind of a like a stretchy gooey consistency a little bit like pancake batter and then I rinse the um the dandelions I usually leave enough of the stem so that my kids can hold the stem as a handle and kind of smother them in the batter and then I'll use that handle to take them out of the batter and put them on a hot frying pan with a little bit of oil and fry them until they're kind of lightly browned and then I'll cut off the, the stem. It's safe to eat, but not very tasty. So I just cut off the stem or to break it off once we're ready to eat them. And then they're crispy and delicious. And then if you wanted to get more involved or take more time for it, you can always add more flavors. You can make them sweet or savory, add spices or sugar, or put maple syrup on them, uh, whatever you feel like. But I don't even measure the, the flour and water. I just mix it until it seems right. Yeah, you can actually do that with chive tops as well. Um, you know how the chives say you can do that with chives too. We've done that before as well. It's really tasty. Oh, so exciting. That's a good recipe to try just because the like the chives are abundant, right? When it's time to, for them to bloom, there's so much. And like, what do you do with all of them, right? Absolutely. Um, is there any other questions um, for Jessica, Heather, or Allison? You can also feel free to raise your hand and we can kind of unmute you there as well. Give that a minute in the chat. All right. So thank you for everyone, um, grandparents, parents, community gardeners, um, whatever your role is in taking care of the land for, for joining us today. Um, Thank you to our guest speakers today for sharing their wealth of knowledge in gardening with kids. And um, you can clearly see that they have passion and love for gardening with kids. So thank you for tuning in today. Um, our next presentation is at two o'clock. As a reminder, we will send a follow-up email um, with resources that our panel has provided and a link to the recording after in case you missed anything or wanted to go back and, and hear our speakers today. So thank you all for, for being here. Thank you for coming. Goodbye.